detectives are unique in that their minds are always dealing with the case, even when they're at home. And so I have this uh, huge amount of respect for investigators, no matter which police agency they're at, because they are the cream of the crop when it comes to going out and solving things that are almost impossible to solve. It shocked me to really see firsthand uh, the notion of um, selling yourself. Have you ever contacted your informant uh, on your cell phone? Mm -hmm. uh, about how many times? I don't know. You know, it depends on the circumstances, how quickly I need to get a hold of them. Okay, what is your cell phone number? Well, I don't... What? You, you don't want to give it out? I don't see the relevance. Okay, you don't want to give it out. That's fine. But that's against the whole notion of being an FBI agent. Carlin, Jerry Dietrich, Karen Hilfman, Prentice Jenkins, and Melissa Balin. At the conclusion of that meeting, he grabbed his chest and he passed away. It's not uh, a secret for uh, several months that we've had wires on several phones and right. stuff like that. And you're saying that you've never had any conversations with those people I've talked about or any other crash officer? about this incident? Yeah. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. Hey, Mickey. 20 years ago, and you were the lead detective on the Biggie Smoke case, right? Do you know of anybody uh, in this crash unit or any other police officer that has a, a stash of guns, whether they're confiscated or bought or whatever? No. Do you, have, do you know of any? No. Do you have some guns that are stored somewhere? Does, do you know of any other police officers that have any guns that are stored somewhere? No. Do you know of any police officers that have tried to uh, get rid of some guns that were confiscated? Uh, okay, this goes back to uh, several crash officers along the way, not just this case, right. but several other cases uh, where other uh, either informants or gang members have been interviewed have said that uh, these crash officers are, are pressing for guns. Well, and then we, then we have uh, recordings of uh, police officers over the phone saying, hey, let's get rid of the guns. Now you see, no, no, as, a, as a police officer, uh, investigating, well, this, is, this is new to me, you know, investigating other police officers, but we got some serious stuff going no, on. No, I understand, but, see I what I'm saying? but I don't see the correlation there. If, why would they be getting rid of them? That's what I understand. And let me tell you something, what was mentioned over the phone. There was four other officers' names mentioned, and your name was mentioned over the phone. Conversations between some police officers talking about let's get rid of the guns. Uh, does that ring a bell no. with you at all? No, definitely. And this is where I'm getting back. You work with ATF. Your primary uh, function is uh, is to get guns and stuff like that. That's what's ringing a bell. And then you got some police officers over these wires talking about we got to get rid of the guns now. No, does, we don't you try know? to get rid of them. We try and get them. No, I mean, does that ring a bell with you? No. The police of Puerto Rico is one police department. They covered all of Puerto Rico. And they were engaged in organized crime. They were corrupt. Michael Carlin, um, just a citizen. This commission only exists because of Russell Poole. Why? Why? Because I think they're totally... You know, well, if I was to say that uh, uh, investigative reporters already had a lot of the information... Oh, no, I'm just giving you my opinion. ...before... The investigation was even done. Right. Okay. No, I'm just, that's my opinion. I certainly, if the guy has all these girlfriends or whatever, I mean, I wouldn't want that being in the paper on me, you know, so whether that's true or not, I don't see how that but, is. Well, what's like what you're feeling about him having a girlfriend that's a dope dealer? Well, I think, obviously, if that's true, that's, you know, there's a problem with that. Okay, what's your feeling about him stealing three kilos of cocaine out on the streets and selling it or out of the property problem. division and selling it on the street? Yeah, absolutely, if that's true, I think there's a major problem with that. Okay. I'm a journalist. Why is this case so important to you? Do you know because of this incident, that entire 18th Street injunction is in great jeopardy and the whole thing may get squashed? Russell Poole is an American hero, and he was a dear friend. Well, I'm telling you because of the, the slew of lawsuits and uh, this particular incident where you're involved, Hewitt's involved, uh, Lujan's involved, 
uh, and any other officers that are involved. A murder like that only goes unsolved if the police don't want to solve it. I've got to try to bring out the whole truth right. in this investigation. Last Wednesday, <clears throat> Russell was visiting the Sheriff's Department with information to solve the Tupac Shakur and Christopher Wallace cases. Then you got all these complaints starting to pile up and these coincidences that are occurring. At the conclusion of that meeting, he grabbed his chest and he passed away. I've seen the murder book. Do you have any suspects? 20 plus years and not one arrest. You tell the truth, you find the facts, and you report them. And everything works fine. I, want you to I understand perspective exactly. right. on this, okay? No, no, no. Oh, we need to get to the truth on... For 19 years, he served as a member of this institution, an institution he believed in. I worked gangs for several years. I worked gang, I worked gang murders, all murders for the last 11 years, okay? I've interviewed thousands of gang members. I worked crash for five years. I worked crash murders, and then South Bureau Homicide opened. I worked, uh, they had 433 homicides in 1993, and the majority of them were gang related. I've, I've been around, I, I've had informants, okay? But let, I know, I know what's going on let, here. As an investigator, you really, you pretty much work on your own ethics. The facts point to something more here. If we could prove a connection between cop and Biggie's murder, it would not only break the LAPD. The investigation is on Hewitt, but you're part of this oh, investigation, let me, let me and you're a witness, but now, because you're holding back on a few details, I don't know what the district attorney is going to do. That's why I am here. That's why I'm passionate, because I think you're going down the wrong road, mister. He knew that most of the members of the LAPD are hardworking, honest people who want the truth to prevail. It would ruin the city. Please. When re the Rampart scandal leadership tried to sweep corruption under the carpet, Russell tendered his resignation. Why did you redact LAPD's connection with Death Row Records? I cannot comment on an open investigation. That decision caused a great hardship on Russell and his family, but he always believed that he did the right thing. As long as it's an ongoing investigation, that evidence stays locked away in the dark. Russell died working on a case. He was doing what he loved. Have you had any conversations with Perez at all, either over the phone or in person? No. No conversations about what, what's going on? No. Uh, how about with uh, uh, Sammy Martin? Have you had discussions with Sam Martin? Over the phone or no. or in person no. to discuss what's going on with Ray. No. We are a matchstick away from bloodstained streets every day. He gave his life to honor the homicide investigator's creed that all resources would be brought to bear in solving the death of any human being when their lives are taken by another human. Everybody just hold your clothes now! I would ask LAPD to please honor the contribution of Russell Poole posthumously. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's a tough world out there. You, could be the you have no idea what the LAPD is capable of. We are distancing ourselves from the story. I got what I need. What I do? Out of the vehicle now! Everybody! Who shot Beast Moss? Exactly what I was saying. Right. And then you, you did not do what I told you to do, is to keep this. You wouldn't even tell me you were on the telephone. 
baloney. I said I'm Detective Russ Poole from Robert I, Homicide. I division. work for Robert Homicide. I can't tell you what this is about. Nobody can know. No, I said I'm conducting here. a criminal investigation on the matter that occurred back in February 26th. You, know, you, say that you knew exactly what it was, and you said, yeah, I'll talk to you about it. And then, that was then I talked to you a second time. You went and talked to everybody, and you got you I told me you got bad you. advice, correct? I did, from, absolutely. What, from fellow officers and no, fellow sergeants? Sergeant. But if okay. you had five years on the job, and a detective calls you up and says, I work for Robert Homicide, meet me here, nobody can know, don't tell anybody. You know what, Ravy flies well. Maybe the if reason I why I did that, because I didn't want any of your fellow crash officers knowing that you're coming down uh, to be interviewed on an I investigation that involves other police officers. I was tr trying to protect your whole interest. Now. By the time I got there at 11 o'clock at night to interview you, that whole station knew exactly what that, that I was there for. When you talk about Tupac, and you're asking me, could they really make those things kind of disappear, those documents and maybe that investigation? And I'm sick to my stomach. The corruption I have found in this organ, my organization. Well, all that hard work that was supposedly done is going to probably all go down the drain. Russell Poole was taken off this investigation. He said, Matt, you just gave us the tip of the iceberg. These guys scurried off to different positions. No cut in pay. Nobody was punished. No letter went in the personal file. You screwed up. You did a bad thing. You did a stupid thing. You discriminated against a fellow employee. And for that, your pay is going to get cut. Till you whack them in the pocketbook, it doesn't hurt. But none of that happened. To anybody. I have been taken off three cases. I even got a confession from an inmate inside the Nevada prison on a bomb extortion case. I got a confession. And they took me off the case. Didn't want to hear about this case anymore. Why? Because I was getting too close. I was getting too close to the actual individuals that were responsible for this. And it leads right up to the Upper Police Administration and the Clark County District Attorney. When you got that kind of power where nobody can question you or nobody has the authority to question you, you can do anything you want to. You can manufacture and make anybody disappear or go to prison. So, when you ask me about uh, Tupac, that's easy. That's easy. And there was some money there. There is, a, there is some money. And unfortunately, my beloved police department, uh, the upper administration, they operate on money. Money and greed and avarice. Doesn't, it's, it's very disappointing. I stayed eight more years after I won. I got no money. But everything changed. The culture changed at the FBI. No. So the lawsuit had almost no effect? Legally, there's two books there. The law is there. And they are cited in many courts now. But in the FBI, then the retaliation really began. So, so my, my whole theory of America is that whenever we have challenges that are large. We, we rally together as a nation, and, and the Sheriff's Department is unnoted for supporting uh, all of the federal resources that are uh, put to bear. The CIA's mission set is uh, clean and simple. Uh, deliver the best data set to the most important leader in the world and deliver in a timely fashion and a consumable fashion. So as CIA director, you spend every moment worried that you didn't get the President of the United States or the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Defense the information they needed to make a really world-class decision in a tough space. It's like the battleship. When it, it can't turn like this. It has to turn for miles and once it starts nobody can say put the brakes on you know we're gonna go there's a cliff over there. We would walk into a nightclub uh, I remember it's called Electric Q and on one table, it'd be the chief of the federal police, 
the chief of the state police, their agents, us, uh, warrants, notorious drug dealers, uh, everybody on one table, enjoying the good life. That night, I think they arrested 40 officers of the police of Puerto Rico, and I can't remember the number, but many were convicted, went to prison for a murder and uh, corruption. Police corruption cannot exist, can not exist, unless it is condoned and tolerated by upper police management. That's the, that's the bottom line. The state police, the federal police, the national security would work together. Everybody knew everybody, the municipal police. Uh, the city of Juarez belonged to us. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to have to get up on the stand, and if this is what your whole story is, and you're going to stick to it, it's think about what you're doing. You're going to, to be, you're, going, you're going to be under oath to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. There's, and it's going to be, it's, it's just not going to fly in a court of law. Out of respect, they would come to us and let us know who they were and what they were going to do. Because if they didn't, then we'd move in on them and throw them in jail. I remember this old timer telling me, there's pull everywhere, but in hell, you can't get a cooler rock. <laughs> that sort of put it in a nutshell. You know, we're people, but we thought that we're the elite. We said so. We're the finest in the world. What? When you get to that point, then you start going down because then you're concerned about your image and appearances. And a lot of that had started with Hoover when he was in for a while about don't embarrass the Bureau, whatever that meant. In other words, you know, you're lucky to be in here. We let you in. Rather than, no, I'm getting in here to try to make the organization a little better, try to contribute, that whole thing. Rather than just, what am I supposed to do? Tell me what to do. What's the, what's the word today? What's the line? And that's what I, I saw once I started getting up into the ranks. Where at the lower ranks, I didn't see that. You're doing your investigation. You be objective, you be fair, you don't lie. And everything works out. That's what we're supposed to do. When I was a cadet, what's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. I, I, I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. It's, it was like, we, we, had, we had entire, we had entire training courses. Uh. The agents that were picking up the money or to the commander, from the commander to the state prosecutor, from the state prosecutor to the governor's office. A chain. I, I will tell you, Director Deutsch, as a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. There is a long record of CIA involvement with, with suspected drug traffickers and drug trafficking organizations. And this is a history that's mostly unknown to the American public. Every, every government agency in Mexico would take bribes. And so the idea of bringing in uh, outside resources is where the Sheriff's Department not only benefits the city of Compton, but we'll go into the city of Los Angeles upon request. We'll go into any other city that's independent that needs a little help. And that's what makes uh, the association with all the police departments and the Sheriff's Department such a positive one. Uh, because we're always helping each other. Uh, narcotics is a very dirty, dirty business. I've only recently become aware of a narcotics trafficking scheme that's been going on since the mid-90s, whereby the LVMPD, the LAPD, and the LASD are all complicit. They're all involved in it. It emanates out of Compton, California. Okay. Now, again, I'm just the messenger. And how many people know this? I mean, I'm definitely not uh, right up there in the food chain. I'm way down here. And I learn about this. It's because everybody else has got a gag order on them. And they're afraid to talk about it. 
if you have information about CIA illegal activity in drugs, you should immediately bring that information to wherever you want, but let me suggest three places. The Los Angeles Police Department. The perjury is a very serious thing to me. I would never lie. I was called at one time and asked, will you testify against the FBI? I said, I don't testify for or against anybody. You testify to the truth. And that's what it says in your oath of office and the Constitution and all this stuff called America, is we're supposed to be oriented towards the truth, not what do you want me to say, and then you'll take care of me later. You have to die. It's about as easy as, as you can think of to kill somebody. There's nothing to it. Press got to, he's gonna start talking. And nobody in Mexico. Well, the high officials, they didn't want that. And if you get too close to the truth, and it implicates the upper police management, well then, uh, uh, they don't like that. Now, getting back to Russell, Russell was, a, was following in the footsteps of his dad, uh, and he was able to uh, work through the LAPD and have all the things that had to be done within the LAPD. He certainly knew the streets very well. For the record, my name is Mike Rupert, R-U-P-P-E-R-T. I did bring this information out 18 years ago and I got shot at and forced out of LAPD because of it. Uh, the police of Puerto Rico put a contract on me to kill me. There was only one way this was going to end. Circumstances in his case were far more tragic because he was killed in the line of duty. At the conclusion of that meeting, he grabbed his chest and he passed away. Because he was killed in the line of duty.